Hitler, Stalin, and Mao are the unholy trinity of names that first comes to the minds of most when thinking about history's most monstrous rulers. Unfortunately, in the sad sweep of history, there has been no shortage of horrible rulers of the same ilk. Most of them did not run up as high a body count of victims as the 20th century's most notorious tyrants. However, some on this list actually competed with or, and in some ways even exceeded, the victim count of the modern era's ruling monsters. Following are 20 things about some of history's deadliest rulers. Number 20. The Hitlerian Marxist. Equatorial Guinea is a small African country with a population of about a million people. It had significantly fewer during the events described here, for such a tiny country. It has endured more than its share of national suffering, inflicted by a megalomaniacal and batty tyrant, Francisco Macias Nuema, 1924-1979. As nutty a ruler as ever existed, Nuema practiced his crazy on the relatively small stage of a small country, for sheer murderous craziness, however, he had few equals, an admirer of both Hitler and Marx, which led him to describe himself and his governance as Hitlerian Marxist. Nuema visited upon his people a genocide that killed or exiled up to 60% of the population. To put that in perspective, the better-known Cambodian genocide claimed more total victims, but Pol Pot had a bigger population base to victimize, he also only ended up killing about 25% of his people. Number 19. The Bonkers Backstory of a Villain, Witchcraft, Human Sacrifice, and Cannibalism Francisco Macias Nuema was born into a poor peasant family in the then Spanish colony of Equatorial Guinea. The son of a witch doctor from neighboring Gabon, Nuema's father had fled his native land after his dark practices. And they were plenty dark, including as they did human sacrifice and cannibalism made him unpopular, he was dedicated to his craft, however so dedicated that he sacrificed one of his own children, a brother of Nuema, an event that left the future tyrant scarred for life. Nuema's witch doctor dad gathered a cult following in Equatorial Guinea, however he got into a dispute with the Spanish colonial authorities, when they demanded that Africans toil on Spanish-owned plantations for slave wages, a request for higher pay got him beaten to death and his wife bereft of the loss, committed suicide a week later, leaving an orphan Nuema and his ten siblings to fend for themselves. Number 18. Political Rise The orphan Nuema was taken in by some wealthy Spaniards, who saw to his education at a Catholic school. He muddled his through to graduation, but was no brainiac after completing his education. Nuema failed a civil service exam three times, however he had political talents and got himself elected mayor of a town under the Spanish colonial administration. When Equatorial Guinea began a transition phase to independence in the 1960s, Nuema served as a member of the territorial parliament, and when the country gained independence in 1968, he was elected president to date that 1968 has been the sole free election held in Equatorial Guinea. Nuema and his family after him, have held the country in an iron grip ever since, early in his reign, Nuema made clear what he thought about elections by executing his defeated electoral opponent. Number 17. Driving the country into the ground. When Nuema was elected in 1968, Equatorial Guinea had a population of about 350,000 by the time his rule came to an end in 1979. Over half had been killed or had fled into exile to escape the insanity of his rule. He began in 1969 by forcing the country's entire Spanish population to leave, and to leave their assets behind. On the one hand, the Spaniards were a reminder of the hated colonial rule, and their accumulated wealth had been forcibly and unfairly robbed from the natives during colonialism. On the other hand, the Spanish settlers included a majority of the professionals, technocrats, and experienced civil servants necessary. For the smooth functioning of the former colony's economy and government, both the economy and government took a nose dive. Nuema eventually responded by abolishing the currency, reducing the country to a barter economy. Number 16. The Insane Personality Cult Tyrants such as Mao Stalin and the Kims of North Korea are notorious for creating personality cults. None of them went as far as Francisco Macias Nuema, who banned religious meetings, but not before forcing priests to preach that God created Equatorial Guinea thanks to Papa Macias. And there is no other God than Macias Nuema. He made the latter the country's official motto, Nuema ingested copious amounts of hallucinogens, which drove him insane, he abandoned the country's capital to live in his native village, taking the entire national treasury with him, and burying the gold reserves under his bed, when the central bank's director objected, 
he was murdered, Nuema also accumulated a huge collection of human skulls outside his house, and beat people with them. He also held regular meetings with ghosts. The capital's main power station was closed, as Nuema declared he could meet the energy needs using magic. Number 15. The War Against Intellectuals Nuema was shrewd, but he had never been what you would call smart, especially not book smart, that left him with an inferiority complex when it came to those better educated than himself, so he declared war on them, formal education was abolished, all libraries were closed and the word intellectual was banned, all teachers he could get his hands on, and every current and former education minister were killed. All forms of media, from newspapers to radio to TV were banned, Western medicine was prohibited as being anti-African, and witch doctors were used instead to treat the sick. Nuema's anti-intellectual pursuits extended to murdering people, who wore eyeglasses because wearing eyeglasses was associated with intellectuals. Even shoes were eventually associated with intellectuals and banned. At the end of Nuema's rule, only six intellectuals were still alive in Equatorial Guinea, two doctors and four technical school graduates. Number 14. A Tyrant's End Nuema was murderous in both his public and private lives, the thought of other men having known his women sexually so displeased him, that he murdered all his mistress's former lovers, his scent was brutally crushed, troublesome journalists were hacked apart, the bits thrown into the ocean, feed the sharks. In one episode 150 opponents were executed in a soccer stadium by soldiers dressed up as Santa Claus, while speakers blared Mary Hopkins those were the days. News that displeased Nuema was fake news. When his statistics director presented figures he disliked, Nuema killed him. Nuema took a relatively prosperous Equatorial Guinea and reduced it to a hellhole. The economy got so bad that 90% of the GDP eventually consisted of foreign aid. To keep people from fleeing he destroyed boats, the railways and mined the roads out of the country. He was eventually overthrown by his own family. When his insanity threatened them, in 1979 Nuema was arrested tried by a military court, sentenced to death and executed. Number 13. When you're known as the Terrible Tsar Ivan IV better known to history as Ivan the Terrible, 1530 to 1584, was the Grand Prince of Moscow from 1533 to 1547. In 1547, he declared himself Tsar of all the Russias, which became the title of Russian monarchs from then on. Ivan created a centralized government, and was a grand conqueror who finally overthrew the last remnants of Mongol domination beneath, which Russia had grown for centuries, he subjugated the neighboring nomadic khanates, and greatly expanded Russia's borders. On the other hand, Ivan was an insanely cruel despot, who subjected his people to a decades-long reign of terror. Number 12. A bad childhood creates a monster. Ivan the Terrible ascended the throne at age 3, and Russia was governed by his mother as regent in his name, however, his mother died when Ivan was 7, and a power struggle erupted between competing boyars, or Russian nobles in which the child ruler was left defenseless. Ivan was exploited and tormented by boyars, who mistreated and abused him in his own palace. That made him bitter, bitterness gave way to insanity and before long, he was venting his frustrations by torturing small animals. By the time he took personal control of the government, Ivan was a paranoid, resentful and angry young man who distrusted people in general, and detested the boyar class in particular. So he instituted a system known as the Oprishnina in the 1560s, a reign of terror that inaugurated the absolute monarchy, that was to be Russia's hallmark for centuries to come. With a special police force, the Oprichniki, Ivan kicked off a wave of persecutions that targeted the boyars, and spread from there in ever greater ripples that soon covered all of Russia. Number 11. The Novgorod Massacre Ivan the Terrible's most infamous act of cruelty occurred in Novgorod, when that city defied him in 1570, he marched on it in the dead of winter and after seizing it, Ivan indulged in an orgy of violent depravity, he started off with the clergy, whom he rounded up and ordered flogged from dawn until dusk, for days on end until they each paid a 20 ruble fine, hundreds died, and afterwards he ordered the survivors executed. Novgorod's population fared no better, he ordered the torture of leading citizens, along with their families, men were executed, and women and children were bound and thrown into a nearby river, where they were trapped under the ice as soldiers patrolled the area on foot, wielding hooks and spears to push down any who surfaced. By the time Ivan was finally sated, over 60,000 had perished. Number 10. Murdering his own flesh and blood. Not even the family of Ivan the Terrible was spared his fits of uncontrollable rage, 
In 1581 he grew upset when he saw his pregnant daughter-in-law wearing summer clothing that he thought was too revealing, so he violently assaulted her causing her to miscarry. When her husband Ivan's son and heir angrily berated his father for what he had done, Ivan smashed his head in with his scepter causing a fatal wound from which he died a few days later. Ivan grieved, but grief did not bring back his son. He followed him three years later dying from a stroke while playing chess. Number 9. The Megalomaniacal Emperor China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, 259-210 BC, pulled off the impressive task of ending China's Warring States period, five centuries of chaos and violent feudalism, by conquering all the Warring States, he then combined them into a unified, peaceful and efficiently governed centralized state. However, unification, pacification, and efficiency came at a high price tyranny crushing oppression, and cruel megalomaniacal rule that reduced millions of Chinese to de facto state slaves. As a result, even though Qin Shi Huang was the most influential figure in China's history, he was also the figure most loathed by the Chinese for millennia. Number 8. Ancient China's Reign of Terror Qin Shi Huang's most trusted and influential official was his Minister of Justice Li Xu. In addition to being a bureaucrat, Li Xu was also a philosopher, who followed a school of thought known as legalism, which advocated strict laws and draconian punishments for even petty crimes. As Li Xu put it, if light offenses carry heavy punishments, one can imagine what will be done against a serious offense, thus the people will not dare to break the laws. Criticizing the law became a capital offense, and cowed citizens were expected to inform on their neighbors. Millennia before modern totalitarians such as Hitler, Stalin and Mao, China's first emperor had created what was arguably history's first totalitarian state. Number 7. Megalomania reigns supreme. After consolidating his rule, and with unchecked power and the resources of an entire empire upon which to draw, Qin Shi Huang grew megalomaniacal, and launched huge projects with massive amounts of forced labor. One such project used 700,000 laborers working on his tomb for three decades. The famous Terracotta Warriors site, discovered in the 1970s and now open to tourism with its thousands of life-size statues, is but a fraction of his gigantic tomb complex. The bulk of the compound is yet to be unearthed, millions more labored to dig canals, level hills, make roads, and build over 700 palaces. The biggest project of all was the Great Wall of China, which did double duty, keeping the northern barbarians out, and keeping the Chinese seeking to flee the emperor's onerous taxation and oppressive rule in. Number 6. Thought Control China's Warring States period had been a period of chaos, but it had also been a golden age of Chinese philosophy and free thinking. The centuries preceding China's unification in 221 BC came to be known as the Hundred Schools of Thought. It was an era during which a broad range of philosophies, including Confucianism and Taoism, emerged and were freely debated. Qin Shi Huang brought that to an end by banning all schools of thoughts, except legalism he saw his new state as a radical break from the past, and to emphasize that break, as well as to keep his subjects from pining for bygone days, he ordered the burning of all history books throughout his realm, he also ordered the burning of books on philosophy, and every other subject except for agriculture, science, and magic. When scholars protested he ordered 460 of them buried alive. Number 5 a fortuitous case of mercury poisoning. Qin Shi Huang's megalomania included a quest for immortality. He literally wanted to live forever. He lavishly funded searches for a life elixir, including an expedition with hundreds of ships that sailed off into the Pacific in search of a mythical land of the immortals. It was never heard from again. He also patronized alchemists who claimed that they were close to inventing the life elixir. One of the charlatans who flocked to the first emperor's court gave him daily mercury pills, he named that they were a life-prolonging intermediate step in his research for immortality drugs, which should tidy Qin Shi Huang over until the life elixir was ready, swallowing mercury every day. The emperor gradually poisoned himself and gradually grew insane. He turned into a recluse who concealed himself from all but his closest courtiers. Constantly listening to songs about pure beings, the mercury poisoning eventually killed him at the relatively young age of 49. Number 4. The Genocide Ear Cambodian Communist Revolutionary Saloth Sar, better known to history as Pol Pot, 1925-1998, was a monster who had beneath a charismatic exterior. When he led the Khmer Rouge into seizing power in 1975, 
there was this little in his background that would have hinted at the horrors he was about to unleash. The country which was renamed Democratic Kampuchea, was transformed into a nightmarish ideological tyranny, masterfully depicted in the 1984 movie, The Killing Field. During the Khmer Rouge's years in power, about a quarter of Cambodia's population was killed in a horrific genocide carried out by Pol Pot and his followers, that was made even worse by its irrationality. In an attempt at social engineering, Cambodian cities were evacuated, and the urban masses were forcibly converted into peasants toiling on poorly run collective farms, roughly three million were murdered or starved to death, before the nightmare ended when the Khmer Rouge were driven from power in 1979. Number 3 the unexpectedly mild background of a monster. Born into a prosperous family, Paul Pot received an elite education in Cambodia's best schools, before moving to Paris, where he joined the French Communist Party. Upon returning to Cambodia, he became a college professor, teaching French and geography, and was beloved by his students as a very kind man. In those days, he frequently spoke on the themes of human decency and kindness, and was described as an attractive figure, his deep voice and calm gestures were reassuring, he seemed to be someone who could explain things in such a way that you came to love justice and an honesty and hate corruption. Some students remembered him as calm, self-assured, smooth-featured, honest and persuasive, even hypnotic when speaking to small groups. Many of those students became his most enthusiastic followers when he led the Khmer Rouge and were among the most ruthless executioners of what came to be known as the Cambodian Genocide. Number 2. The Batty Bedouin Born into a poor Bedouin family, Muammar Gaddafi (1942–2011) rose to colonel in the Libyan army. Before staging a coup and seizing power in 1969, he then made himself dictator, styling himself brotherly leader and guide of the 1st of September Great Revolution of the Great Socialist People's Libyan Arab Jamahiriya. Gaddafi headed a bloodthirsty and insanely erratic regime that terrorized, cowed, and bewildered his countrymen for 42 years until they finally had enough and overthrew and killed him in 2011. Called to the Mad Dog of the Middle East by Ronald Reagan, just before sending jets to bomb him, Gaddafi's reign was marked by dramatic twists and turns, he morphed from socialism to Islamic fundamentalism, from sponsorship of terrorism to avid cooperation in the global war on terror, and from an Arab nationalist to deriding Arabs and turning to African nationalism instead. Number 1. The Arab Mao Gaddafi saw himself as a messiah, modeling himself on Chairman Mao, he published The Little Green Book, containing a political philosophy labeled the Third International Theory, a mix of direct democracy, Arab and African nationalism, and Islamic socialism as an alternative to capitalism and communism. The book was required reading for Libyans, and formed the theoretical basis of Gaddafi's government. In reality Libya was a kleptocratic dictatorship, governed on the basis of nepotism to enrich Gaddafi's family and his tribe, with a grossly mismanaged economy that survived solely due to an abundance of oil and gas.